If you're somebody who's invested in quantum computing stocks or you're thinking about investing in quantum computing stocks, then this is a presentation that you're going to watch because we're going to talk about three pure play quantum computing companies, how they're progressing and why their stocks are flopping. So just some disclosure before we get into this, uh, this gentleman here, David Deutsch from the Quantum Computation Center at Oxford University said this quote, he said, quantum computation will be the first technology that allows useful tasks to be performed in collaboration between parallel universes. And I recall this quote being uh, put in front of an audience of several hundred investors and physicists, some of the smartest people in the world, and everybody just nodded their heads. And it goes to show how complex a technology we're talking about. Even the experts out there can't explain how quantum computing works or if it's even working. So the only indicator that we look towards to show true progress would be revenue and especially revenue growth. So this Dilbert cartoon here is a a uh, great one. Dilbert's boss comes along and asks how the quantum computer prototype is coming along. And Dilbert says that the project exists in a simultaneous state of being both totally successful and not even started. And then his boss says, well, can I observe it? And Dilbert says, that's a tricky question. So just a bit of nerd humor there. Do me a favor on the lower right corner of this screen. You see that red subscribe button? Please click that and that will help support our channel. A lot of you have asked why we aren't bigger. Well, it's a function of trying to get people to subscribe and to share our content. So if you do that, then that helps us grow and it provides us with an ROI, which makes it worthwhile to produce these videos. So when it comes to quantum computing, we like to check in about every year or so. And if you watch the media, there's a lot of promising press releases. So IBM delivered quantum computers to customers in Japan and Germany last year. And five years ago, D-Wave had uh, brought out their 10-foot tall quantum computer that retailed for $15 million. They appear not to be selling very many of those. A Chinese startup has reportedly started offering a desktop quantum computer for $5,000. And then 2019, Google claimed to have achieved quantum supremacy. We actually wrote about that. And I'll put a link in the description of this video with some of the more key research pieces we've produced around quantum computing. But today we're going to talk about three companies that became public using special purpose acquisition companies or SPACs. And this chart shows the performance of SPACs over the past year compared to a NASDAQ tracker fund QQQ. And we have our own data. So we have a tech stock catalog, which has somewhere of around 450 tech stocks in there with a lot of rich data fields. And we're able to filter on SPACs and 90% of these disruptive tech SPACs that we've covered trade less than their offering price of $10 a share. 78% have lost uh, half their value or more, and 43% have lost 80% or more. So SPACs were a disaster, as we said they would be. We've always warned retail investors to avoid them like the plague. We've only invested in one ourselves, and even then quite tentatively. So the three companies we're going to talk about today all came about as a result of SPACs. You have IonQ, Rigetti, and D-Wave. These are their respective tickers. Their combined market cap of about a billion and a quarter dollars, not very big. Their performance has been dismal, but what's even more dismal are the revenues they're bringing in, which you can see in 2021, not a single one of these companies had meaningful revenues, which we uh, have defined as $10 million or more. And then you can see on the far right here, the revenue that they've brought in for the first three quarters of this year. So let's start about... Uh, start talking about IonQ. This is our preferred of those three, which isn't saying much. And that's largely because of the caliber of the team, though uh, others disagree with that, in particular Scorpion Capital. We'll talk about that in a second. But they ended 2021 with $2.1 million in revenue, not very much. That's less than half of what they originally estimated in their SPAC deck. And for all these firms, they see have, seem to have missed their SPAC deck estimates. And you need to hold management's feet to the fire. The SPACs 
totally overpromised and underdelivered, and nobody seems to say anything about that. They should be asked why. They should be held accountable for that, but nobody seems to care. So their estimates this year, again, missing their SPAC deck estimates of $15 million. They're expecting uh, somewhere around $10.5 million. Uh, Good news, they have $555 million in cash and assets that they can use to survive. They've signed a contract with the U.S. Air Force Research Lab. They're working with Airbus on a project to optimize cargo loading. But 40% of the revenues this year came from a related party. We raised this concern at the beginning of this year, and several months after that, Scorpion Capital debuted their short report, and we haven't had a chance to comment on this. I took a brief look at it, just noting the concerns that we share about related party round tripping. And this slide uh, we had produced uh, before in our previous presentation on IonQ and had pointed out that they have this relationship with a university that's considered a related party and that they're driving revenues from that relationship somewhere around close to $16 million. And as I said, 40% of this year's revenues come from that relationship. And you can go into the research piece that was used to produce this video I've linked to the 10Q and cited the exact page so you can go read this for yourself. But um, similar to Ginkgo Bioworks or Palantir's uh, work they've been doing with SPACs, we don't consider related party revenues to be very meaningful because they don't show proper industry demand. So when it comes to IonQ, when we look at the progress they're making, we will discount that for the related party revenues. So let's move on to talking about Rigetti. They had projected $18 million guidance for this year in their latest deck is between $12 million and $13 million. So again, not hitting their um, promises in the SPAC deck. Apparently, $4 million of this revenue is tied to contracts that are currently being negotiated with a government customer. And that's a problem because nearly three quarters of their revenue so far this year comes from the government. And we don't like firms that have a strong dependency on the government because they have all the power at the negotiating table. So Rigetti has about $161 million on their books. That's about two years of runway based on their current burn rate of around $19 million last quarter. However, they are in danger of being delisted as shares Shares float around a dollar a share. What that means is when they go below a dollar a share, typically exchanges will then send a warning letter and they have a certain amount of time to correct that. And if they don't, they'll get delisted down to the over-the-counter exchange. And that's not a place where you want to be. So we'll take a little break here. And I've thrown up this comic that I quite enjoy. It's Einstein in bed with a lovely lady. And he's looking over at her. You can clearly tell that they've uh, finished having intercourse and he says to her to you it was fast it's quite hilarious and if you look at uh, this video right below where the video is at you can see there's a share icon if you click that share icon you can then email this video or send it via whatsapp or twitter and share this video with uh, anybody that you think would be interested that really helps us out so let's move to talking about d-wave this company has been a massive disappointment. We were following D-Wave over a decade ago, and we had put out several pieces looking at how we might be able to get indirect exposure to the company, and investors were so excited. These were some of our more popular pieces back then, how you might be able to get indirect exposure to the world's oldest and greatest quantum computing company. Well, when it comes to revenues, they haven't done much. Last quarter, they recorded just $1.7 million in revenues. That's despite a customer base of 63 commercial customers like Volkswagen, Lockheed Martin, and Basf. So not very impressive stuff. 2022 revenues expected to fall between $7 million and $9 million, short of the estimated $11 million projected in their shiny SPAC deck. And the worst part is that they only have $9.5 million on their books today. So they'll either need to raise more money via equity, which means giving away shares at uh, extremely discounted prices and diluting existing shareholders, or they'll have to take on debt. So it's not looking good for D-Wave. They've made so many promises and said so many great things were happening, but it's just not reflected in the revenues. Now, I wanted to touch real quickly on a firm that I had a chance to meet with 
Um, this would have been uh, over three years ago now in Vancouver, BC. I used to spend a lot of time scouting startups across the globe, and I met with a firm called One Qubit, and they rarely would do media interviews. And I was very grateful to sit down with the founder and have a long conversation where he uh, told me everything in layman's terms about quantum computing, and it was absolutely fascinating. So he talked about how this term quantum inspired refers to approaches we can take to optimize algorithms that take inspiration uh, while we uh, research quantum computing. So we don't necessarily have to have quantum supremacy. As we progress down that path, we can still have um, progress and achievements that are worth noting. So he said error rate is the biggest impediment to achieving quantum supremacy and that a lot of firms want to talk about qubits, but that's the equivalent of looking at the sticker price on a car without knowing the mileage. It just doesn't tell you enough. So what he reckons will happen is that quantum supremacy will emerge as a single use case that demonstrates that supremacy, and then they'll reverse engineer that and start expanding, and that the first to market, the firm that actually accomplishes that, may not want the world to know. So whilst all these other companies are out there uh, sending out press releases and talking to the media about how great they are. The real winners probably aren't saying anything at all. And that's because when they actually do realize quantum supremacy, they want to keep it for, to, to themselves and leverage it as much as possible. Names like Microsoft, Honeywell, Google, IBM, they're sinking billions of dollars into quantum computing. And we don't know what they're up to aside from what they tell the media. On the right-hand side here, I've listed a handful of names of private companies working on quantum computing. So there's a lot happening that we don't know about just because there's three publicly traded quantum computing stocks that we're looking at. That doesn't mean that's the entire scope of what's happening. And um, I wanted to quickly mention some names here that we're, we didn't cover today because we don't believe these firms belong in the same realm as the companies we've talked about today, Archer Materials, at this firm, Quantum Computing Inc. You can read our pieces and we talk about why. And of course, there's Arkit Quantum. They're doing encryption and we may very well do a, a piece on them later, but they don't belong uh, in the collection of companies we've talked about today. So when we... Talk about quantum advantage, that's a term that IBM came up with, and I wanted to give you this example. This uh, researcher at Microsoft, his name is Matthias Troyer, and uh, he took a problem, this was in 2019, the gentleman at One Qubit told me this, he took a problem that would take 30,000 years to solve, and then he developed an algorithm to solve it in 30 years. That's remarkable, right? But just recently, he announced that he developed an algorithm that can solve that same problem in minutes. So you see where we're actually making a lot of progress as we try to commercialize quantum computing that's actually benefiting society and mankind that isn't necessarily the big headline of quantum supremacy. So that's uh, perhaps the quantum advantage that IBM is talking about. So just to conclude, these three publicly traded stocks are all pure plays. We wouldn't invest in any of them right now, mainly because none have meaningful revenues and they're under our market cap cutoff of a billion dollars. Um, Delisting may happen for Rigetti and fundraising needs to happen for D-Wave. IonQ looks the most promising aside from their related party revenues. And of course, you want to look at that short report. Usually where there's smoke, there's fire. And certainly if you're long, IonQ seems to have a lot of cheerleaders. If you're long a stock, you really want to read that report and see what you think might be credible in there and worth checking out. So certainly don't discount the big four, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Honeywells, and the dozens of other startups out there that may very well be making a lot of progress and not saying anything. So as usual, we'll check in a year from now and see what's happening. Um, please uh, do me a favor. Go ahead and you see this blue icon on the right. Please click that, subscribe to our channel. And I've put up a video here that's quite interesting, which talks about IonQ that you can check out next. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this today.